Well, looking at the audience, I found that probably I'm only one of a few who has a grey beard and a grey hair. <laughs> and everyone is... <laughs> so, well, if you, if you take it as a life begins at 60, then I'm still a toddler. And I'll try to sort of uh, uh, take you along with some of my adventures that I had this, uh, in, my, in this uh, life and some thoughts that I, that I acquired. So let's uh, begin uh, with, the, with my talk. You can see I have changed the word healthcare to health uh, because I felt that health has a broader sense uh, in which it will uh, it is going. So let's first uh, uh, start with the first slide. Does it work? Thank you. So you saw in my title is the innovating health technology for the deprived 80 percent. Well, the idea is this 80 percent of the global population is in the third world and they are deprived of modern healthcare technology. And I think as a scientist particularly, this is a failure for all of us. Yeah, we have trodden paths beyond imagination deep into the outer space, but we have not been able to eliminate the curse of a very simple disease called diarrhea from the planet, nor of arsenic menace that we can see now in Bangladesh. A recent report, I think it's just today or yesterday, that in 2012 the number of mobile phones will exceed the number of human beings on the earth. But we have not been able to provide safe drinking water for a majority of the Earth's population, though it should have been very simple. And if you can look at the photographs, it's very colorful. Well, people, photographers would like these photographs, but the colors mislead the eye. If you look carefully below the veils, there is a helplessness that we can see. Well, we have astounding innovations. We have CTs, PET scanners and what not. And we can look deep into our bodies, deep into the brain. But if you think carefully that ECG and X-ray, these two are one of the, I think the X-ray one is the first photograph probably. They were invented more than 100 years back. But this is yet to reach the majority of the people on the planet. So this is the situation we have to think about. So think of the other innovations. They will take a millennium if we allow it to go on like this. So why is this happening? So we have to think and answer the question. Why is this dep deprivation? Well, the, I, I come to two solutions or two uh, points. First is innovation is linked to necessity. If someone feels a need for something, then he or she innovates something. Now, for technology, most of it, the more, all, most of the innovations happened in the West, particularly in the last few centuries. Well, probably there were innovations, say, a thousand years back in this part of the world, but no more. So, most of the people of the third world that we talk about, uh, we call third world, actually, they have lacked innovation due to certain reasons. And so, they did not invent or innovate things that could solve their own problems. Now, in the Western world, they have solved their own problems using technology. But it's unfortunate that we in these countries, we have not done that. We are just importing technology from them and we think we have acquired technology. But this is not technology acquisition. Technology acquisition means one has to have it within themselves. They, can, they should be able to develop, they should be able to do research. So that's technology acquisition, not just using a mobile phone or using a car. We are just driving a car. We, are not, we don't have a technology acquisition of a car. And the second point is, somebody gets rich if you advertise mobile phones. Even for diarrhea, if somebody advertises Orsaline, they get rich. So that's another point that makes the things going. But if you uh, develop a technique and promote 
which nobody gets money from, is just for the people, suppose, how to get a safe drinking water. If you, promote, if you just let the people know, nobody gets any money in the pocket. If you give them the technology to themselves, nobody gets any money. So that's the reason that some of these techno techniques, which are very simple, they're not promoted. They're not sort of told around in the newspapers, not told around in the televisions. So you can see the picture here, that 90% of tube wells in Bangladesh in certain areas, overall is to about 20 to 25%, but in certain areas which are shown in pink and red, more than 90% of the tube wells have arsenic contamination. And you have seen some photographs of people being affected. And newspaper reports said that millions of dollars have been put in for, to find a mitigation, to find a solution. And I think it's about 20 years now that arsenic was discovered in Bangladesh. Have you seen any solution or any solution widespread? No, it's just pockets here and there. They are not practicable. And I tend to I coin the term glamour research. Even after going into several conferences in, in different countries, I find people, our scientists have a tendency to do some research that will sort of surprise the people or something, there should be something very complex things so that we can write long equations and locked in long uh, sort of complex technology. Only then people will uh, listen, oh, he has done something great. But if you do something simple, nobody gives any notice. So that's another point that scientific innovations have not been useful to us. I'll just come to a few points. No one told us. You just I mentioned that we have a problem with arsenic. People are dying. They have, don't have a solution in Bangladesh. But no one told us that surface water is free of arsenic. There is no arsenic in, your, in the rivers, in the canals, in the ponds, and in the dug wells. Nobody told us that. And nobody told us that it is very easy to destroy diarrhea. They only have diarrheal germs. But nobody can promotes or says it's very easy to destroy the diarrheal germs. Just boil it in your kitchen. Just boil the water, just bring it to boil, and all the diarrheal germs will be destroyed. So such a simple solution, but nobody is promoting it. Why? It doesn't give money to anyone's pocket. And even when you have a flood, you can just simply boil the water somehow, and you can make the flood water drinkable. And I'm coming to some innovations. Suppose if you don't have uh, fuel, or if you don't have the situation of boiling water in a flood situation, we have some innovations. I'll come to that. Again, as I said, I didn't know before that in our books we learned that you have to boil to 100 degrees Celsius and keep it for 20, 20 minutes. You have to boil. But some doctors told me no. And then I found out from books, yes. It notes it needs only 60 degrees and half an hour to destroy all the dirty germs that you see there. So this is a knowledge which many of us don't have, but it is there in the books. And this is, you know, the well-known pasteurization technique for milk uses 60 degree half an hour. So even you don't need to boil. So it's so easy to destroy diarrheal germs, but nobody told us. And also rainwater is pure and safe to drink. And again, if these ladies who have, you can see the picture, yeah, I think it's a tremendous powerful picture. The ladies are rowing hard on a lake which has got fresh water, which could be, probably it has diarrheal, it may have diarrheal germs, and they used to use that before, say 30 years back, but we have made them switch to tube wells. Again, tube wells gave somebody money, so that was a lot of promotion. And now we have uh, arsenic in tube wells. But these ladies, had they known that they could just boil the water at home, this flood water or the water from the lake, and they could collect the rainwater to drink, then they wouldn't have, have to have this difficulty and to take this struggle. So it's a pity. So what's the message? So the message I take from all these uh, sort of uh, things, that we have to find our own technological solutions in each country. We have to find our own technological solutions. People from other world, they can help, yes. As I said, you'll see some of our innovations actually had an 
initial help from the north, from countries like Britain, they helped us a lot. And that helped us uh, gather some ex experience and uh, which led to some innovations. And I think PhD is another thing. Our universities have become colleges. Most of our universities, they only give undergraduate degrees. They focus on undergraduate degrees. They don't have full-fledged or very uh, strengthened, strong PhD programs. We all send PhD for, to, for goods to anybody uh, doing well. We say, oh, go abroad, go abroad. Now, we have been doing it for the last 40, 50, 60 years since the Britain, uh, British left as a colonials in 47. After we became free, uh, further, we became free in 1971. Still, we, have, we think that we have not become mature enough to do PhDs here, to supervise PhD students here. So, this is a pity. And I'm from Dhaka University, the prime university in the country. And I find the, this uh, mindset, even among our teachers, our colleagues, that go abroad. But the thing is, when you go abroad to do a PhD, you solve their problems. So you solve the problems of the first world. As I said, necessity, your all research necessities are linked to your needs. So a first world need is not the same as ours. So what our boys and girls, when they do their PhDs abroad, they solve their problems. They gave them, since uh, in Silicon Valley, there will be a lot of Bangladeshis working. And they're contributing to American wealth. Well, maybe some of the technologies trickle down to us, but it's not enough. And we are losing our best talents because our problems are overwhelming. And we need talented people to solve those problems. But in this, this situation, we are just sending all of the talents abroad. So this country, these third world countries, they cannot prosper or they cannot solve their own solutions. So I think PhD in our own home country is a very important thing and we have to do that and also we need to support any sort of technological innovation that the people do and again I would say that our government's pol government policies are not supporting uh, the application of technology. Yes, the science ministry they would give you money for uh, innovation in technology but when you come to apply it because unless you do an industry or you commercialize it nobody gets the benefit. There the country is very uh, sort of shy. They don't like people here to uh, market their own technology. They would rather like things from, the, from abroad to come here. So that's a pity. And the second is the Western model. I think the Western model is that when you innovate something, you take a patent, and then you get 16 years or 20 years of freedom. You earn as much as you like. But in innovating, you know, in every innovation or every invention, you have used a lot of other people's work and a lot of other people's brain have come into it. But one single person gets all the benefit. Say, in, uh, Sir Jagadish Chandra Bose from, Bang from Bengal, this country, it is now recognized he invented the radio for long transmission. But he didn't take any patent. He thought that his innovation should be for everyone. And, but Marconi, well, Marconi, I definitely I thank Marconi for the effort that he used to spread the radio all around the world. But the thing is, he took the credit entirely to himself, which was wrong. And also, if you look into uh, some, in, in, say, if we look into our old societies, say our old civilizations I, I'm talking about, which are thousands of years old, what do you see? Say one person, a farmer in Bangladesh, I think Haridhan or someone, he found in his, um, in his field a particular bunch, bunch of rice which was different from others. A paddy stock was different. And then he found out that this gives a very high yield and it's a very robust variety. And then he cultured it for one or two years, he got a lot of seeds and this came out to be a very successful quality of rice, paddy. And then if he could take a patent of it, or he could keep it secret and make a lot of money, but he didn't. He, anybody wanted the seeds, he gave them free. So if I look and compare, so in the Western world, if you develop some technology, you keep it, you keep within you, yourself, and become rich. But here, they are giving the technology away. He's a technologist, and he gave the technology away. So I think there's something 
to learn from this experience and that has helped us in developing our own thinking. So I'll come to that now. Uh, so, so this is the background. Uh, some of it I initially when I started my research work 30 years back I had some idea, yes, some religious sentiment that it's only one life, I should make it meaningful. That's why, in spite of offers from abroad, I didn't go, I, I came back and I started from very scratch and I wanted to make things which I, uh, to work in uh, things that I can make. So that's how I started from this uh, Dhaka University Karzun Hall building which is famous and you know Professor Bose which is who is linked with both science and statistics for a thing in physics, very high things and he worked here and we are proud that we have, we have this lineage or linkage and our journey began more than 30 years back when one of our seniors, they, he was thinking and I came back as a young PhD after doing my PhD in 1978 and we made together a bone fracture healing uh, apparatus using electromagnetic stimulation. It was still a new thing and we did some research and it came out well. That was a starting but after that we came into link with England, uh, Sheffield University and we had more exposure and after that uh, we went to some areas which I'll come later but first of all I come back to one of the things in the process of this research. Uh, we were concerned about the diarrhea problem and the water problem and as I said some doctors said that I was doing some research on solar energy as well, but the thing, you know, most of the solar water heaters, they cost 1,000, 10,000 Bangladeshi taka or more. Uh, but somebody said, can you make a very cheap solar water disinfection system? And he gave the information that you don't need to boil. It's only 60 degrees that you need. So that put me into thinking that was in 1982, I think. And I started working, and this is the sort of thing I came up with just using simple things which are available in the villages and it costs less than two dollars. A village home, they can make it themselves. It uses hay, bamboo, a bamboo tray which with a black paint and then some polythene sheets. You pour water in, in one layer and have air on top in two layers. And uh, for the final version you see on the left, and then after two hours, it needs one and a half to two hours in strong sunshine to get more than 60 degrees Celsius. And we have checked it with microbiological, all the diarrheal germs are killed, a sort of diarrheal germs are destroyed. And even it, is, uh, it, it's, uh, it works even at 50 degrees because there's an ultraviolet ray contribution as well. So this, is, this uses a greenhouse effect, the standard uh, solar heater uh, technique. But the challenge was to make it cheap and we could succeed in that and recently we got a funding from UNESCO yeah and also uh, you can do rainwater harvesting most of the harvesting methods tried by others are using rooftops and when you use a rooftop you don't have any control there can be birds d uh, droppings and uh, rotten leaves and you cannot drink that but if you make a simple gadget like that using those polythene sheets a hole in the yeah you make a hole in the middle and then uh, or you can make a funnel of it so and this water would be clean so this is a very simple technique that if you could teach them and recently with the UNESCO fund we have started disseminating this technology we have published a booklet and one in Bangla one in English and we are trying to train people and yeah that's one part of it one of the innovation which uses very low technology but uses modern concepts so that's one of the successes that we made and again from Sheffield we had some expertise in electro I had some, uh, some, some uh, yeah, expertise in computer interfacing and that was back in 1985-86 and with their help I made the first EMG equipment in Bangladesh it can also measure ECG and actually the main equipment here uh, and yeah also we made uh, ECG equipment and this uh, the main equipment there is still working in Bangladesh after even after 23 years so that's the point I want to make. If we develop our own things, then it can, it can be sustainable. We have changed the computers, we have changed softwares, but the main unit there is still working and it's still in a hospital and we look, uh, we try patients and even, in fact, doing this, research, uh, doing this experiment, we came up with certain difficulties which traditional knowledge doesn't have. And we had some innovation. We now can detect cervical spondylosis by measuring 
on the wrist. And this is a new technique the people in the West are taking from us. In Singapore, they have, been, uh, they have taken our work. In Nottingham, they have started working on this new technique that we have developed. And these are just, we try to make low-cost versions of the standard equipment. And this is another, this is a hand for Rajia. Well, this girl is a very poor girl. Her mother used to collect old newspapers. And, you know, in Bangladesh, some people leave bombs in the footpath some, sometimes. And this girl, while playing with a small colorful bomb, she just, it just blew in her hand, and she lost her hand. And so we wanted to give her something. So we, uh, well, we are trying to make something that works, but it is taking a long time. So I gave her a cosmetic hand, and you know, uh, I f phoned some farms here. They said it will talk more than, cost more than 20,000 taka. So what I did, I just bought a hand from a mannequin. You know the mannequins that are in the uh, stores, on the dress stores? I just bought a hand for 1,500 taka and colored it, managed to fit it to her arm and she is, at least she has the confidence that she has, she doesn't, uh, she, when going out she wears that. And now I'm trying one with a spring so that the thumb she can, uh, she, normally it will be closed, she can pull it out and hold something, at least she can probably write and we are trying to develop that. And of course we have also ideas for doing an automatic one where she can control it by her thought through the muscle, but that would be maybe some impractical. But this one is something which is, uh, we feel would be useful. And this is again uh, another innovation which uh, happened only within a very short time. Uh, one gentleman from Pakistan, he was in a lecture which I gave in Bardem, Dhaka, and seeing my innovations, he asked me, can you make a thing called pedograph where you need the diabetic patients, you know, they, have, they lose senses in their feet. So they don't know where there's a pressure. And ultimately they get ulcers which lead to uh, gangrene and then amputation. So if you could test a person's foot pressure, then a remedy, uh, remedial measures can be taken. He, he or she can be given a sole with the, which spreads out the pressure. And uh, the, he said that the German firm has started marketing a product which cost 50 lakh rupees in Pakistan. And he wanted something cheap. So I toyed around and I saw something in Sheffield in 1980s which used a different principle, but that technique has not been marketed. It uses a light a uh, total internal reflection of light. And I toyed with it, I tried to make something. I initial experiments, I think I um, gave me the confidence that probably I can. Then I asked some money, which is much less than 50 lakh. I asked only for six, six lakh taka as a research fund. And we could make it within one year. And it is now, it has, uh, we set it up in Pakistan two years back. Uh, it is now still, and it gives a, uh, it has a computer software which we developed ourselves as well. The hardware software all developed here. It shows the pressure points and the time variation of the pressure points. And they are using it for continuously for the last two years and recently they have asked for five more. So this again is now being used at Bakai Medical University in Karachi. And World Health Organization in its 2011 compendium of emerging techno innovations, they put this into their list. And again, uh, recently, last year or a bit more, back there was a seminar where I, f I knew, came to know that Bangladesh Government Health Ministry has uh, s uh, set up 800 computers in rural health complexes, they call Upojela health complexes, and all of them have internet connection. Then I talked to the minister that if we make some small equipment locally, then you, tell him you can have a good telemedicine system, uh, to which they agreed. So uh, we developed a telemedicine system using improvisation. So I, we asked them, what are the things that you need? So based on their requirements, we made four items. One is a digital stethoscope. So a village paramedic will put the stethoscope on the patient's chest and the doctor in Dhaka will listen to the sound and he can then suggest what happens. So that's, so, so what we did, the innovation is such, because we just used the, sorry, I, uh, we just used the stethoscope head of a normal one, normal stethoscope, cut the tube, put a microphone in there and took it to the computer and then used standard software. And on the other end, we, we, we bought a very expensive uh, headphone because normal headphones wouldn't give you the low frequency. So there we had to spend some money. But again, that's only about 3,000 or 4,000 taka. So that makes a digital stethoscope. And then uh, they wanted a microscope. 
So what we what we did is bought a Chinese microscope for 10,000 taka, and after a thorough search of the internet, I got a good camera, webcam, which has got two megapixel and a Carl Zeiss glass lens, and uh, we fixed that. And it gave you a digital microscope, which uh, if you want to buy, it would be cost, costing 10 times more. And you can see some pictures, these onion skin cells at low magnification and at high magnification. So it's quite successful. And then this is a, they wanted the extra view box. We just made the extra view box and that camera again on the top. And you can see the, the pictures outputs. And then for the ECG, they wanted us to buy something foreign and then connect it to the computer. We found that no one has got outputs, and we got one Chinese, which has got outputs, but the outputs were distorted. So we made one from scratch. And in doing that, as I was talking about technology, you know, in ECG, you need 12 lead connections. There are 12 lead configurations. We found in the internet, everywhere we searched, there were some circuitry for the main amplifier, but there was no circuitry available for the switching. So we had to design it entirely on our own from our own scientific knowledge. And there comes the R&D. Because we had the last 30 years experience and we could do it within six months. Because I had the experience and my, I have got a good bunch of students, some of us of them are here, and they contributed to the development. And we have a very modern ECG equipment which can be also uh, used standalone. And it, it uses USB port. And this is the ECG. Uh, you can see the small equipment there, oh sorry, the small equipment there, the ECG and the, the trace, and the doctor in Dhaka will see the traces in real time. When you put the electrodes on the patient, the doctors in Dhaka will see them in real time and give the diagnosis. So we have these, so we have these four items, and we also had a colposcope for cervical cancer, but it still needs some improvement, but these four are ready. And we are actually negotiating with the government for uh, use in the rural health complexes. So that's again another success. And then we come to another new idea that is focused impedance measurement. That's again our innovation uh, as, as a simple human body probe. You know, electrical impedance means how it gives a resistance to electrical currents. And though electrical currents have been invented long back and people have been trying to use it for diagnosis of different disorders or diseases, because our human cells, all the body cells, they have some electrical properties. So it was natural to think that it should be able to find something. But the technologies were not ready to do that. And recently, one uh, Professor Brown in Sheffield, actually, we had the link program with them. He developed, he was a pioneer for this electrical impedance tomography, where you have this 16 electrodes around you, and you have an image like that in a CT scanner. And, uh, but this was too complex and expensive and, of, and had some problem that is still it has not come to the clinical stage. So we did, thought of a very simple idea. We thought of focused impedance measurement, a method which uses six or four electrodes and can localize a point and used it for stomach emptying. And we, is, and we had some tests of uh, how, how good it is at focusing. And also this work was done in uh, war in the UK, they have taken up this work as well. And so it has been found successful and people in Warwick, people in Oslo University, people in Korea, Kyunghee University, they are using our method to develop something new. And there's a lot of potentials. We are working on lungs ventilation, abdominal fat thickness measurement, respiration rate of babies, cervical cancer detection, breast tumor characterization, and stomach acid secretion that is good for diarrheal research and blood emptying, and also it may be used for tumor ablation monitoring. And there could be many more. So electrical impedance could be the technique of the future. And here we have quite a bit of contribution. Maybe uh, this focused impedance will come a lot in the market. So these are the universities they are working on focused impedance now. And so I'm coming to the end of my uh, talk. How can we deliver the benefits to the whole humanity? So that's again, if I go back to my initial slides, that existing methods do patenting and commercial, <coughs> and commercial manufacture that this existing method is not working. That's why you have this deprivation or this disparity. So we think that in every country, people should do their own R&D and produce equipment in their own countries. As, you, as I showed you, my equipment is working for the last 23 years. 
You cannot expect it from a foreign equipment. After six months, something goes wrong, you have to throw it away. It's better to buy a new one. So we are doing, having the luxury of throwing equipment away before their lifetime. And that's why we want to make an open source technology movement. You know the internet is open source. That's why we, everybody can use that. Linux is open source. So even in healthcare, I think we should have open source. And we have made a philosophy or decision that we will not patent our products. In fact, the focus impedance. Uh, when I gave my talk in, uh, in, a seminar, in a conference in Dartmouth in America, I presented focus impedance. And two persons came up. One was a Swiss gentleman. He came from an R&D company. And he said, if you patent it, then I can make it for you. Or you can make them from Bangladesh and sell them. And he also thought of some useful applications. Uh, but I said, no, we don't want to patent. So they have not taken it up. I said that we'll try to make, develop our own, and then we'll distribute the technology to people. We actually, side by side, I have set up a non-government organization, which I call Bangladesh Institute for Biomedical Engineering and Appropriate Technology. And with that, we'll have a sister organization which we'll name, we have not yet done it, Center for Technology Equalization. And the idea is the economic disparity that we have now in the world is because of technology disparity. And if we, if we cannot bring the third world, people in the third world up in technology, there cannot be economic, economic equalization. So technology equalization should be the first thing we should look for. And that's why we are trying to do that. And hopefully uh, we can uh, go ahead. And I think if we do that, sky is the limit. Thank you very much.